still with uh, Dr. Alan Mendoza from the Henry Jackson Society. Uh, Alan, how much do you think... I mean, I think, as far as I can work out, uh, Joe Biden's about the weakest president on the international stage that I've almost ever seen. He's certainly very weak in the Middle East. I mean, what kind of effect does that have on that volatile region? How different do you think it might be if, say, Donald Trump was president right now? Well, I mean, on the one hand, it's impossible to make the comparison because you never know which version of Donald Trump gets up in the morning. However, what we did see in the Trump period was, of course, um, A, in this case, absolute staunch support for Israel. And look, to be fair to Biden, he's given that. He's been he, he's done the same sort of defensive support. But I think the difference is in the offensive side of things. Donald Trump showed in January of 2020 that he was prepared to be offensive against Iran when he took out Qasem Soleimani, the terrorist-in-chief. And he did that, by the way, when the entire US security establishment was shocked that he chose that option. The options were put to him. It was the most radical option. He took it. I think the difference between Trump and Biden is that everyone understands that Biden will not take those offensive no, options. Sure. He's defence, defence, defence. And when you're defensive the whole time, it means that your opponents think they can keep on prodding at you in order to try and find that one weak link, that place they can push you and push you around. And that's the problem with, with playing defence the whole time. I mean, despite the focus often being on America when it comes to playing peacekeeper and uh, how to react to international um, situations and crises, there are various other countries and entities who all have a huge amount of influence. I want to draw your attention to the EU. Their security chiefs are meeting this week week in Brussels to discuss what the reaction should be to what Iran has done. And yet, Joseph Burrell, who is the head of their foreign office, so to speak, has turned around and said, oh, let's not talk about sanctions against Iran. Let's not do that. Softly, softly, we need to have a diplomatic, open relationship with Tehran. That is the way to maintain peace. Yet, if you look at the EU trade statistics since 2015, when the JCPOA was back on the table, the Iran nuclear deal, the EU have been selling them tons of stuff, machinery, nuclear reactors, chemicals. It's no surprise, frankly, that the Iranian drones, which they also sell to Russia, now contain 40% of parts from Europe. Uh, do you think that they're still not getting this? Do you think people like Borrell, in many respects, actively enabling Iran to become more aggressive? Absolutely. I mean, you've highlighted a very important point. The fact is that that nuclear uh, deal has led to, you know, an, an upsurge in European trade with Iran. And that's, you know, gone down very well with European companies. And that, by the way, is the reason primarily why, despite Iran breaking everything in that deal since 2018, 2019, and basically enriching uranium to a nuclear level at this point, the Europeans have not come out of it. And I'm sorry to say that we, of course, are also a signatory to that deal. And we, too, mm. have not come out of it. And it makes a mockery of British and European diplomacy that we are sitting in a nuclear deal which has the facility for snapback sanctions when the other party breaks the rules, as they have openly done for five, six years now, and we don't take that. That is a weakness in our diplomacy, and no wonder Iran feels emboldened and enabled because it seems to think it can do anything, and the Europeans and the British will not put sanctions oh, on Oh, yeah, it. the press here will just worry about the 0.1% of Israel's army that comes from Britain, not the 40% of bits and bobs in Iranian drones that are also coming from Europe. It is rather mad. Alan, thank you very much. We'll be uh, getting your thoughts on many other things after the break. Dr Alan Mendoza is still with us in the uh, studio. What, what are your view is the chances of this, uh, are the chances of this conflict escalating? I mean, I think it's very strange that the, the international community, if you like, have kind of sanctioned Iran to retaliate against that Israeli attack on their generals a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and you kind of get the impression that if Israel responded just once and a bit, that would be OK. Uh, so we are kind of all watching kind of performance art in a way. Uh, and we're having demonstrated to us the real difficulty of trying to uh, constrain conflict. Uh, what do you think, Alan? Do you think this uh, flashpoint that's been happening now uh, will uh, just be a flashpoint and we'll return to normal? Or do you think uh, this has got the potential to escalate, frankly, up into World War Three? Well, it could, of course, be either of those eventualities. What, what we don't know sitting here is what the thoughts are within the Israeli war cabinet, how they're interplaying with the coalition of support that they got on Saturday night, 
and how far they're willing to push this to go forwards. It seems quite clear to me that Israel has to, of course, respond to what happened. It was a direct state-on-state attack, and it wasn't just a casual thing. Uh, It was 300 to 350 missiles, bombs, other things coming our way. It sometimes makes me laugh to think about what people like Lord Cameron will be saying if Britain face that kind exactly, of that bombardment. Do you think they would... I really wonder, do you think they'd get up the next day and say, look, um, we're going to not do anything, people of Britain? And what do you think the British reaction would exactly, be to that? Point. The general public here would go mad, saying, how, how can you allow this to stand? Now, it's one thing if the international community says, right, we will take on this and we will punish the Iranians. We'll punish them with more sanctions. We'll punish them with our GC prescription. We're going to make their lives very miserable and grim. But we're not seeing that either, are we? We're not seeing any approach there. So Israel's going to have to do something. And the question about whether this escalates is what that something looks like. And it could range anywhere from a cyber attack, something uh, to a proxy, one of the proxy, Iranian proxies, to an attack on Iran itself, or even let's take out the nuclear program. Because the one thing that we can tell now is that Israel has been quite right to point out the existential threat from an Iranian nuclear bomb. Any country that lobs that number of missiles and, and drones at you is clearly seeks to eradicate you, and that's why the Israelis cannot at any cost allow uh, Iran to have a nuclear weapon. Yeah, Paul, I'm going to come back to you on that. I think Alan makes an important point there, which is that perhaps what we've seen now exposed, I mean, those of us who follow geopolitics have known that Iran have been uh, a ne'er, uh, ne'er-do-well for a very long time, but perhaps uh, this is now exposed and given the green light to saying to Iran, one once and for all, that's it. This stops now. And the West coming together to put Iran back in its box, so to speak. Yes, I, I would agree with that. Uh, but I, I do think that Iran would actually fear a full-scale Israel Israeli attack, because I think Israel has, has it within its power to do considerable damage. Um, we all know that the might of the IDF, the Israel Defense Force, Uh, It's one of the best armies, the best trained armies in the world. So I think with all the powers coming together, I think Iran has got a lot to fear. And I I really do think there is going to be a response. And as you were rightly saying, um, can you imagine Britain just sitting there or the United States sitting back and saying, well, um, let's just de-escalate, just leave it alone. We've been under attack. So what? No, this, this won't happen. What are the chances, Alan, if there is a response and a response to the response? We find ourselves in a situation where we do then have kinetic warfare between Israel and Iran. And I think under those circumstances, even though our good friend Lord Cameron and uh, Joe Biden have both said, look, we're not going to help you in being an aggressor. They've both still tacitly said, but if you're under attack, we will be there. Could this therefore not just bring us into the theatre of war in the Middle East, but have effects and ramifications for us here in the UK? Yes, it certainly could. And I think it is right to point out that the UK, the US have been very helpful to Israel defensively since October the 7th. They've been supportive. They've offered all kinds of assistance in that field. And Saturday night was a great example of that. And I suppose were there to be a significant war between the parties and were Israel to, to, to face concerted attack, and on many fronts, given that Iran would uh, you know, unleash its proxies at that point, we would, I'm sure, come into that in defence of Israel uh, because we cannot allow Iran and its terrorist proxies to win. And that, of course, could lend itself, therefore, to terrorist activities on the streets of the UK. We know that we are riddled with Iranian agents and influence in the UK. We've seen that Iranian uh, journalists in exile have been attacked threatened. Uh, There have been other incidents here where we've seen the influence of Iran in the UK. Iran's got a network here, and I'm sure that if it felt that it you know, wanted to uh, action it, it could launch that network against uh, British people as well. So we've got to be mindful of that in that way. But that's not an excuse not to do something against this country. It's an excuse to say we've got to remove this threat, this malign influence uh, from, from our shores and from overseas as well. Uh, last question to you, Paul. Uh... How real is the nuclear threat from Iran? Uh, Because, uh, you know, I've always thought, well, why doesn't Israel just take Iran on? With the help of the West, uh, it's much stronger. It could blow blow Iran off the face of the earth. It is stronger. Uh, But I guess the fear is, is just how advanced they are with their nuclear project. What is the feeling uh, among Israelis and Jewish people about that? Uh, Just how... Uh, militarily uh, ready is Iran uh, for a nuclear strike? Well, it has to be recalled, of course, that um, Israel actually took out 
Iran's military, uh, sorry, nuclear capability uh, a couple of decades ago. And I think this was uh, with the full connivance of the United States as well. We Nobody really knows what its capability is, but there is an existential threat. And, you know, again, based on past history with Iran, it's an unstable regime. They could well launch a nuclear attack um, and not really, not really care too much about the consequences. Yeah, Alan, I want to uh, ask you exactly the same question, actually, and get your insight into that, particularly given the sort of a growing warm relationship between Russia and Iran. One assumes that Russia must be helping them out on the nuclear front, although they have rather condemned quietly uh, Iran's actions over the weekend. Do you think Iran are close to having a nuclear weapon? I think that given the amount of time that's passed, given the egregious breaches that we've seen and given the assistance of third parties, it is highly likely that Iran has got the capability now to develop uh, you know, uh, the sort of uh, a nuclear weapon of some kind. Now, that doesn't mean they will do it, and it doesn't mean they will be able to deploy it. There's a whole separate deployment issue you've got to get over as well in terms of how do you take this very volatile uh, sort of uh, technology and then turn it into an actual weapon. But yes, I think they've probably reached that stage now where we've got a um, we've got a, a situation of understanding that they're at that level. And that tells us that we're in a very dangerous phase because we don't want them to break out. We don't want them to break out if at all possible. We want there to be a, um, a cessation of this activity and preferably want it to be back into its box. And if the regime refuses to comply, which it hasn't done, then arguably there's a case for taking out the regime to stop it going nuclear.